Good morning. Um, so apparently not everyone did good on the homework assignment five, right? Um, I think very few people got. Um, so he, I, I just saw it right before I came to class. I, had, I didn't had a chance. Um, if you have any questions about your grades or something, let me know. Um, and if there's something we need to go over in class, let me know too. I think people didn't get the first question right, first and second one, right? So I, so you, you should have had the. Um, his high-level view on what went wrong, right? But I don't understand, but actually it went up um, by a point, percentage point, so which is still, um, so I haven't, I haven't looked at the grades to see you know, what, what, what's happening and everything. So right now, I think the um, mean and median are half percentage points above 91. Um, and I don't know how the grades would go. I think we have 85 percent done. So, I mean, I would guess like anything above that median would be some form of an A, um, and that's so. So my policy is if the difference between you and the previous grade is less than one percentage, then you get the same grade as the previous one, right? Um, so it's kind of I mean, those all look like they are within percentage of each other, right? So this is slightly more fall off on this end. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's where we stand, right? Yeah. I think um, on, the, on the homework, the hardest problem for me, at least, was the second one. OK. Can we go over that quickly? OK, I forget what the second one was. Um, I can bring it up here if you want. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> that was so gay, dude. <laughs> <laughs> So was, was that one, um, how many writes you do for write five operation, right? Um, so write five is, you have the parity along with, it's a block level parity mixed in with the data, right? So if you have five disks, right? All of them are data, all of them are parity disks. So if you take one block, right? Let's say the data is here, data is here, data is here, data is here, and parity could be here. For another data, the parity could be here, and so on, right? So if you, so that means the, the parity is essentially computed by doing some operation on these data, right? So let's say these are data, data one, two, three, four, right? So you take data one, some operation, the parity operation, data two, right? where the dot is the parity operation, right? Without going into detail what, they, what <coughs> it is. Some sort of exclusive R or, or some operation, right? So you have to do this to get the parity data, right? So if you modify any one of these data items, if you modify, let's say, D1, right? That means your parity would change, right? That means you need to read D2, D3, D4 to calculate what the parity would be. You can't do the parity in place. so. You, so originally you had D1, uh, D2, D3, D4 giving P, right? So if you modify D1 to D prime, D2, D3, you cannot do the, you cannot use the previous parity block. So you need to read the rest of the other blocks, compute the parity, and create P prime, right? Is that what was asked, what was being asked? Yeah, that was the first one. First part. Yeah, to write to one block, you have to. Um, yeah, so yeah, you, so you would have to access the other blocks, and you have to write the uh, the parity block. So you said you were to access the, the parity block and the data you were writing. You didn't uh, mention that. I'm sorry. I guess because in this case you would have to access all five or five blocks of data. I guess. 
you have to access this, 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 and you would have to write um, this and this. You would read three blocks and write two blocks. Yeah. What is the answer he gave? He said two. That's my answer. He said two? Yeah. yeah. Answer is two blocks? Yeah. Two blocks I access. What did I say in the answer key, remember? I'll, I'll take a look at that. Do you have your answer keys? What? No, I didn't bring the answer keys. What did you say? Problem two? Oh, problem two. The reason that he gives two blocks is because you're only talking about reading. Hang on. Oh, how many blocks are accessed in order to perform, right? Hang on. <laughs> Let me look. look um, yeah, I don't want to do this on the frag. So I need to look at what the real question was and stuff, okay. right? So, um, so what did you guys answer? What was the answer that? You, oh? <laughs> okay. Um, let me go back and read read the. What, I, I don't remember what the question was, and so. Um, yeah, if it is a trick based on what exactly you know some aspects of exactly how it was worded, um, then I would give credit because it's not meant to be playing English games on precisely what the wording was and stuff, right? So if that's how it was, then um, I want you to get the picture of what happens when you do a RAID 5, not necessarily. Um, so let me let, let me look look at that and, and get back to you on Monday, right? So, so we're continuing back with the with the notion of like trying to look at what operating systems are and stuff. And, and I was going to look uh, go through how you would design um, based on servers and desktop and all those things. But I figured we can look at it from a different perspective, right? So the when we look at different modules, right? When you're looking at like in you know, process module and, and, and all those things, we had a notion of scheduling. We had a notion of scheduling processes and all those things. And we only looked at that component. <coughs> we are looking at what would it mean, like how would you decide what process to run, right? But really, when you change, when you context switch a process, when you put in different process, a whole bunch of things happens, right? When you're talking about the module, we only talked about what's the cost of context switch, and we didn't want to do context switches too often, right? But there's also other, other costs that when I switch another process, then I have to flush your TLB, right? Because your TLB cannot be used by somebody else. So you have a ca cost of TLB flush, you have a cost, cost of flushing your cache. You lose the locality of your file, right? All the sequential files that we were, we were talking about that um, your, any operation you do to make the file sequential, all, all lost, right? Because the previous process, let's assume the previous process had a bunch of blocks in a file that it's reading. And then a new process comes in, it may be reading a whole bunch of different files. It may be reading them sequentially, but from a disk perspective, it switches from wherever you were to the new one. And that may or may not work out the way you intended, right? What looked sequential may no longer look sequential. What looked random may actually turn out to be sequential, right? So those costs have to be added somehow. So we can't just decide to put a new process. Once you do a new process, you, you have to pay those costs. And when a new process comes in, you may have to flush buffers. You, you may need memory and stuff, so you may, you're flushing stuff. And that may cause something else to, um, so when the whole process comes back in, all the stuff which used to be in buffer may no longer be in buffer, right? Um, and the other, other component is when you're switching a process, it may so happen, so if you have a, a, a page that was modified, right, 
And if a new process comes in and needs that page, it would have to force the, this page to be written to disk. And while it's being written to disk, you can't use that page because it has to finish the stuff. So even though the operating system may give it, you know, give it to a new, uh, give the process to a CPU to a new process, that process can't really do much because it's it's waiting for the buffer to flush. And by the time the buffer buffers are flushed, you may have to be swapped again, right? So in the worst case. So a real operating system, a real scheduler that you want has to look at all the stuff, not just the cost of switching you, but the but the other side effects of what 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 you're doing, right? And figure out what when is the best time to schedule a new process, right? Ideally, you would like to say if you only need a little bit more time, I should be able to give it to you and let you finish before going to the other one. And as you can imagine, that's all you know. Taking all this into consideration is not a trivial task, right? To make life more interesting, you want all this to be done instantaneously, right? You don't want the OS to think through and come up with an algorithm. So you don't want the operating system to run a data mining algorithm to come up and say, the best schedule for you to run is this process, right? And, and that's, that's too, too, too low, right? And that's where all the, so at, at a very high level, operating systems, what they do is trivial, right? But at a very low level, when you have to make these decisions on which way you want to do the trade-off, it may or may not work out. So ideally, you would like it to work out for every one of your applications. And that's why you pay big bucks to Microsoft and all those, uh, all, all those companies, right? And I, I know many of you have gotten interviews at Microsoft and uh, uh, kind of stuff. And so it'll be interesting if you guys uh, go there and see um, what we kind of brush through in a very high level. You know, they're worrying about it for a long time, right? You know, the scheduling, you'll probably see like a really humongous group trying to focus on how, how to make that uh, work, right? How many of you are actually going to Microsoft? I know some of you got an interview. Okay. One? Wow. Oh, two, three. Okay. Um, are you guys going to the same group or? Well, I'm going for a program manager. So, um, you go for a program manager? Yeah. Wow. What does that mean? <laughs> That's like the creativity, like before programming. Okay. So I, I will not program at all. Okay. Very few, I, I would think very few people actually code, right? So how many of you finished the homework project? The homework project five, the Linux one? You, you must at least start to look at the code, right? Um, and if you look at the code, how many of you think the code is horrendous? How many of you think it's horrendous? Wow. <laughs> it's not supposed to be horrendous, right? It's supposed, so if you believe the open source mantra, which says that many people look at the code and Vegas looking at ext2, ext3 file system. So ext2 has been around since early 90s, right? So it's been around for let's say 10 years, right? And a whole bunch of human beings, everybody who uses Linux have looked at that code, right? And they, they made sure that the code is as easy to understand for each one of them and it has no bugs and stuff, right? So that piece of code has, has been looked at by so many people you have to believe that that code is the best that programmers can come up with within the last 10 years, right? If you find that you can't understand that code, so if you don't understand code because you don't know C, that's a different thing, right? Or you don't know enough like good C, right? But in terms of what it does, it has to precisely do what it has to do. It can't just say, let's just allocate an integer here, right? I don't know why, let's just do it, right? Because somebody else who comes after you would say, I mean, I don't understand that code, you have to make it clear, right? So that code ought to be very easy to read, very you know, very straightforward. If you find that hard, you should look into device drivers, right? Which only people who use a device driver would look at, you know, because if it's a strange device driver that no one else uses, then it hasn't been through that much of uh, stuff, right? Um, so, regardless, right? If you want to make a change in that code, you don't just you don't like start your day and say, Let, "I'm going to write thousand lines of file system code," right? because that code is evolved over 10 years or something. So even if you're a programmer in Microsoft, right, I don't think you end up like writing lots of code. You write, end up writing code which you can defend what it does and stuff, right? Um, but program manager sounds like it's a big managerial kind of uh, thing. It's like thinking about the user more than anything. Okay. And where are you, where are you guys going? Uh, I'm going to the Windows 1 here. Okay. Group, which is 
like the virus skin and stuff. Okay. And I'll be working in Microsoft Office group. Okay. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to to see how you know where some of the stuff that you guys looked at uh, turns out and stuff, right? So rather than going through the you know the uh, devices and stuff, one other way that the, why this course is important is regardless of what you do, operating system is always in the way, right? So does somebody want to volunteer on what they want to do, what interests them as a research topic, some some topic, right? Let's, let's say graphics, right? If you want to work in graphics, you don't want to work in operating system, you want to work in graphics, right? Graphics, you imagine you have code operating on images, right? You, you have large arrays for images, and you do lots of math, right? So you operate on lots of these images. So let's say you're do, making a video movie or something, right? You're doing animation. So you have lots of these arrays and lots of these stuff, right? So how would your knowledge of what you learned in operating system affect such a person? Let's ignore Hello World programmers because it doesn't affect them, right? Hello World is not exactly a high performance kind of thing, right? So if you're, if you're doing a graphics program, right? So let's assume that graphics is basically you have a bunch of large arrays. Each one is a, is a visual image or something, and it's on disk, right? How would you read that objects from the disk, knowing what you know about how operating systems deal with files and all those things? You want to get one of the arrays at a time, mm -hmm. the entire array at a time. So you want to be able to make sure you can do that. Mm -hmm. So would, would memory mapping help you or, or not? So if you're doing an array at a time, you're assuming that you can do sequential stuff, right? Yeah. But if your context switch in the middle, things can go bad, right? If you want to write back, Right, you're doing certain operations. You expect certain things to go a certain way. Right, remember the disk and spin and all those things. Right, would doing it through memory map would that be a good thing? Right, remember memory map. You, you say this is all memory mapped into the file system, into your memory, and you use a virtual memory to figure out when it went to flush, how to flush, when to go to disk. Right, would that help you, or do you think you can do a better job by reading and writing explicitly? There's no right answer, I mean, whatever comes to your mind, right? Um, well, if, if you're going for sequential access, then you would want to use memory map, right? Is that, is that what you feel? Oh. So, so do, do you guys remember the memory map uh, I.O., right? So the memory map, memory map I/O. The, the good thing is, you let the operating system decide when when it should write, right? Because you you access it through your memory system, and it's flushed whenever it needs to, right? So do you trust that the operating system can do a better job than you on deciding when to flush, or do you think you can do a better job? There's no right answer, actually, right? So yeah, so you don't want to trust the OS with that task. You want to make sure you can explicitly do it yourself. So the answer to that would, would decide how you write your program, right? So the answer may be that you can trust the operating system. The answer may be that you can't trust the operating system, right? But regardless, when you go and do this stuff for another you know, graphics or something, you have to be aware that there's this distinction, right? That one of them can give you good performance, one of them may not give you a good performance, right? And you have to think about what that means. So my, my, my larger theme is operating systems are not, you know, whatever you learned here would come back and haunt you or come back and help you with whichever way you look at it, wherever uh, you go, right? So if you take a database course, right? So how many of you take a database course? Or if you take a database course, one of the things that you want to do is you, you do all kind of manipulation. Eventually, you want the stuff to go to the disk, I and mean, that's that's the that's what you want to do, right? You want them to be in a stable storage, right? So let's assume that you have a transaction, right? I say transaction begin, but I say my account equals like four dollars and end, right? Very simple transaction, right? What you want is whenever you, you come into the transaction, when you get out of here. This four is committed to the some storage, right? So it's committed somewhere so that 
once this has happened, once this finishes, it's stable, right? You don't want, <coughs> if the machine crashes at this point, right? You don't want to be in a state where account is undefined, right? Which means that you will have to make sure this goes into the hard disk, right? So if you were a database developer, what are the challenges you would have to solve in doing this, right? You can, you can do this as a simple write account, right? Open a file, write, write this account value, and then close, right? Would that solve your problem? Yeah. Well, if something goes wrong in the middle of doing it or something, you have to worry about rolling back. No, no let, let's assume that you, you finish up to here, right? Let's assume that the transaction went through, that you were able to finish this point, right? So within your program, you were able to come up here, no error at all. Is that good enough for the higher level of what you want to do? As long as it flushed. And if you close it, is, when you close, does that mean flush? Yeah, so you need to understand what happens, right? So you need to understand what this close means, right? What does a file, what does a close in a program really mean? What do you think it means? Yeah. Close the file so anybody else can open it now who wants to be reading or writing. Yeah, but in terms of... Also flush, I don't know if it includes flush or not. There is no flush in the C, right? There's only a flush in the okay. buffered I.O. stuff. There's no flush. There's a thing called call sync, right? Which would sync, which would flush the buffers into the thing, right? So when you do this close, all you say is it's now in some buffer cache, right? Remember the buffer cache we looked at for the for the file system, right? At this point, it's guaranteed to be in buffer cache, right? So buffer cache is a set of is a memory location, right? So if a machine crashes at this point, your write is lost, right? So you have to really make sure that it actually is synchronized to the disk. So you have the system call called sync, which <coughs> flushes all the buffers. It actually queues all the buffer buffers to be written, right? It actually doesn't wait for it to be written. But assume that it, it sync when the when the sync call comes back. All the buffers in your memory, all the buffers in your uh, operating system has been sent to the disk. Is that good enough? So when you do this, it's still in buffer. When you do this, all the buffers have been sent to the disk. Would that still be okay? Does that mean the disk is finished recording them? When you say it's been sent to the disk? Yeah, it just means it's been sent to the disk. It doesn't mean it's been recorded on disk, right? <coughs> it just means it's sent to the disk, right? And this have like eight, if you if you buy this, they have eight megabyte or I think I mentioned in class when you're talking about those, right? They, this, they have a buffer, right? It just means that this buffer was sent to the disk um, and that's it. And the disk will write it at some point, right? So when you're building a database, they worry about this a lot, right? Because they need that at this point, at some point, that content has to be written to the disk, right? Which means that you have to mark with the buffer cache, you have to mark with the, the disk cache, and so on and so forth, right? Are you allowed to look into the what whether it thinks are in cache? Should you be able to look at it? If the OS is trying to do it transparently, you're not supposed to look at know that, right? And that's the stuff. I mean, if you if you if you talk to database folks, this problem is very important, right? You need absolute guarantees that it's actually returned into the disk. Yeah. Then you could read from the disk and make sure um, after all, after all these operations, you can read from the disk and make sure that you read back the correct data. Yeah, but if but if the disk has a buffer, right? If it's being written, it'll read from the buffer, right? Yeah, read won't won't help you at all, right? In fact, if you start reading, it may decide that it's being used a lot, so why flush that, right? I mean, it, it might decide to keep it in memory, right? Unfortunately, you don't know what, what code the disk is running, right? Um, so if you look at the, some of the RAID cards that you can buy, um, some of them have 128 megabytes of cache inside the RAID card, right? 
above the, what the disk can do, right? So if you talk to the, the database guys, they worry about this a lot because there's a fundamental disconnect between what the operating system wants to do. The operating system does not want you to know that there is buffering and all those things. You know, it's supposed to all be magically happening, right? Which is good in the case where I said about memory mapping and stuff because you don't know what's happening. It's in bad in this, this kind of cases where you don't know if it actually goes out, right? And you need to worry about those kind of stuff when you when you do the, the sort of a program, right? Um, can you think of some other field that you would use programming? Compilers have to worry about this stuff too. Compilers, when they produce code, they have to produce code which operates on that particular machine, but also plays nice with whatever the operating system can do, right? In terms of, to the extent possible, you know, leave stuff in in in, in places where you can have little uh, less overhead, right? Use the instruction set in such a fashion, you get bet better performance, right? So if you think about any of the fields that you would use this stuff, right, it comes back to haunt you in very subtle ways, right? And those subtle interactions can make or break what you do, right? How many of you taken a networks class? So networks is one of the, and one of the cl classes I, I, I'll, I'll be teaching in fall is sensor networks and stuff, right? So the, the idea here is you have, this is one of the stuff that we want to look at from a research perspective, right? All the sensor network and all those things, you have a notion of these like bubbles and you send like packets through um, and so on and so forth, right? But if you look at what the operating, very few people actually look at what the operating system would do, right? So assume that you have a, uh, let's assume, ignore these things, right? We haven't, uh, we haven't gone through networks, but we can look at it as, as a, a, a I.O. operation, right? Suppose you have a machine and packets are coming on the network card and you're sending packets out on the network card, right? What happens for these operations, right? There's a network card, right? It gets the packet, right? And like any I.O. device, when it has a data, it'll send an interrupt to the kernel saying, yeah, I have, I have something for you. The kernel has to do something with it, right? It has to do some kind of processing depending on what kind of network you do. And if it has sent, sent it out, it has to do some kind of processing. And then it somehow tells the network card or the device that you have something to process, right? That's the generic way you do stuff. And when you have something data to be read, you tell the device. When you have some data to come back to you, you get an interrupt, right? Is that, is that clear, right? So that's how you operate with the keyboard, right? When you, when you press a key, your keyboard controller sends interrupt to the processor saying, I have some key for you to read. The, the, the kernel would get an interrupt, read the key data, and do something with it. And if it has sent to the screen, it sends it to the screen, and so on and so forth, right? So one of the things that, that is, is bothersome in this situation is this whole processing, right, would happen inside the kernel, right? We never so far talked about who should be accounted for what, right? I mean, all, all the times we only looked at a process and, and stuff like that, right? We never worried about how do you do accounting, right? What I mean is, if you have two processes, right? P1 and P2, right? And let's assume that you're looking at CPU resources, right? And let's assume that this is using A and this is using B percentage of the CPU, right? You expect A plus B equals 100, right? You would like it to be 100, right? But you know, you know it's not gonna be like that because you know you have A plus B plus C, right? Which is what the kernel would use. Yeah, OS kernel, right? And you want this to be small, right? Because that's one of, one of the things we've, we've been saying all along. Anything that operating system does is overhead. So you want to keep this as small as possible. You don't want this to be, you don't want your system to be working 80% on, on, um, on the kernel's behalf, right? So you want this to be as small as possible, right? That's easier said than done when you have these interrupts, right? When you get an interrupt, somebody has to deal with the interrupt, which means that somebody has to do those things, somebody has to do the processing, right? These all add up to C. Right? 
And that's one way of doing a denial of service attack kind of stuff, right? Where I can keep sending you lots of packets, right? And you can't do anything. You can even notice it on a regular machine. If you keep moving the, the mouse a lot, right? Your CPU has to, it'll, it'll max out on the CPU, right? Yeah, if you, if you go to a Windows machine, run the task manager, and if you keep moving the mouse, right, your CPU will go up to 100%, right? Because every time you move the mouse, you get interrupt, operating system has to do something, and that something is, it has to say, okay, you move the mouse <coughs> to a different location. But it can't say stop, because those are all belong to the operating system kind of stuff, and there are a whole bunch of issues like this, right? Um, and, and those all go to the notion that operating system, what's, what's its role compared to what you're, what you're trying to do, right? Um, so I, I hope that that's, so, you know, I, I, so we could use this time to cover more topics, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you this notion that anything you do, you have to be aware of what's happening, and hopefully you'll be able to use those, uh, those stuff, right? And one of the other stuff is, when you have lots of memory, right? Let's assume you have four gigabytes of memory for your laptop, right? You can't really use four gigabytes on a 32-bit machine because there are some addressing issues, firmware issues, and all those things. So you can only use like three some uh, gigabyte, right? You, even though it's, it's la let's keep four or three or whatever, right? Some some large number. What can you do with that memory for a normal machine? Like you know, for example. Um, your laptop and you run, let's say, PowerPoint or Word or web browser or something, right? And assume that your web browser needs, let's say, 100 meg, and your uh, PowerPoint needs like 500 meg or something, right? Let's assume that you only need one gigabyte worth for your programs, right? Do you just use one gigabyte and then Leave the other ones wasted. What what can you do with those memory? Use like your swap space or something. You don't use it for swap space because the if you think of this as a virtual address, right? Your swap space would only be stuff that you couldn't hold on here, but you have plenty of memory, right? So you shouldn't be swapping, right? Yeah, you shouldn't be swapping. Let's assume you're not swapping because you only need one gigabyte, right? So you don't, you won't be swapping, right? What can you do with other memory? Yeah. You can use it as a disk cache to keep all of the files that you are mm -hmm. using after the hard drive, so you have to keep that. Yeah, so you can you can use that as a disk cache, right? So what happens to a disk cache once it's returned to disk and no one is using it? Yeah, this cache is a good thing, right? So suppose you, you opened a file, your PowerPoint opened a file, it used it as a disk cache, and the file you're done, the PowerPoint is closed, and the data is returned to the disk, PowerPoint application is gone, the data is in the disk, right? What, what, what do you think will happen to the cache? Should happen to the cache, or what do you think will happen to the cache? So now that you have a cache item for which there is no owner, and you know, it's just hanging around, right? Actually, that, that's that's the direction where the answer is. But Mark is free available to be used again, but I don't think it's erased. So it's too yeah, it's free. No one wants it at this point, right? <coughs> it's free because the the processes are finished, and it's free to be used by somebody else, right? And the traditional operating system would say it's free to be used by somebody else. Put it back in the free free pool. And when somebody wants it, give it to them, right? But most op modern operating systems don't precisely do that, right? They keep, they remember that this particular cache was caching some contents from the disk, right? And if you ever open the file again, it'll give it to you, right? So it is being, it will be used as a buffer, right, where this is similar to the file uh, thing I was talking, talking about yesterday, right? This is a buffer for which there is no owner, so you should technically be like getting rid of it, but you practically keep those things around, so when you ever come back and open the file, it'll come back to you really fast, right? So it has, so now it has a it keep track of free blocks and the pseudo free blocks where it's free 
whenever it wants for somebody else, it can use it. But you would rather not give it to somebody else, it'll give it to somebody else. Give it to another process, right? And it really pays off because most people use PowerPoint, Solitaire, or one of those things, right? So if you if you stop using Solitaire, <coughs> you come back. Even though it's a completely new application, all the buffers are already there and start working, right? You may be able to notice that if you go to any of these machines, start your PowerPoint and exit out of it and go away, come back after half. I mean, don't touch the machine, don't let it do something. I mean, don't run tasks in the background. Go away, come back after 15 minutes, start your PowerPoint. It'll be much faster than the first time, right? Because it's in the state where it's free. If anybody else wanted it, it would have been given. But if nobody else wants it, it'll give it back to you, right? How many of you notice that behavior? You need to have this with lots of, mem lots of memory, right? It, it doesn't happen if you have very little memory, right? Only three of you noticed it, but um, you should be able to notice it a lot more. So, so that's one of the reasons. So if you look at, if you buy a, a system with three gig memory, right? And if you look at the, the statistics, right? You'll say you have like, you know, 50 meg free or something, right? And usually people freak out and say, but I have three gigs and stuff. I mean, so if you have one gig memory, right? You'll say you have 50 meg free. If you have two gig, you'll say you have 50 meg free. If you have three gig, you'll say you have 50 meg free, right? How many of you notice that behavior? I see people complain about how like this operating system is bad, right? Because it's, it's, it's using, it's a memory hog, right? How many of you use the applications in Windows where it says you run this application and give you more free space, right? You, you, see, you should have seen the pop-up ads about this, like this magical program that you run this program and it'll magically free up more space, right? Have you guys seen those? So what do you think it, it, it does, right? Yeah. I just think it allocates a lot of memory mm -hmm. so that all of the other programs are swapped up to a disk. That's one thing, but I think it, I think it also marks with this this behavior, right? Yeah, it allocate it, it it grows and kicks all this stuff out, right? Um, yeah, it, it can do something, right? It, it can do whatever it does. It it's not what you really want, right? I mean, this the behavior that it's doing right now is the one that you really want. Even though it looks like you have so few free memory, that's really what you really want because. All the memory is being used for you. When you come back for something, it's there for you, right? If you run this application and it, it flushes all the stuff, if it cleans out all this memory locations, then yes, you can virtually see that now you have two gigs of free memory, but that's a bad thing because two gigs of free memory really means that two gigs of cache that your program was using for, your system was using for you or waiting for you to come back has been flushed out, right? Right, but a lot of people like that. I mean, they, you know, they, I mean, apparently people buy those things because you know you see so many pop-ups, right? So unless you understand that this is what is happening, people do th this kind of stuff. Mean, you know, they, they just want to see that they have all this free space, right? It's a bad idea to have a free space because that says that you're not using it for anything, right? Um, right. So the more memory you have, the, the, this kind of funny stuff happens. You'll notice it if you're using a Mac right now, the newer Macs, you know, whenever. So the newer Macs can run PowerPC <coughs> code in Intel by doing a translation on the fly, right? So you can run a different architecture machine that does a translation on the fly. So when it does a translation, it goes into the buffer, right? So the first time you start PowerPoint, it's horrendously slow. Next time you start, it's extremely fast because it's not only memory, but it's also done the translation on the fly, right? So there are, there, there are stuff like that, right? And you, you see people making those claims about, you know, we can make this OS faster and all those things, and you have to wonder, um, that's not a good thing, right? So at, at this point, what I, what I wanted to look at was, you know, depending on different kinds of architecture, if you were to define, uh, uh, the, design an operating system, right? which none of us are going to do because uh, operating systems are a big business stuff and you know, Microsoft probably has like thousands of people working on, on these things. But we can ponder over what would be, what would be a good thing, right? So if you, if you have something like a PDA, like you know, one of those um, 
you may have it as a you know smartphone or um, iPhone or if you're really geeky, you can have this Linux watch, which I don't think IBM sells, right? They were, they were working really hard to um, sell this. They've been doing this since like 2009 or something like that, right? You can run a, a Linux on the, on the watch and stuff, right? And they obviously, as you can imagine, they have very little power, very little process, you know, computing facilities and very little storage and stuff like that, right? Um, so most of them would, you would run, you expect them to run some sort of uh, real-time kind of applications, right? But one of the thing is, many of, many of them let you run multiple applications, right? It, it looks like you're running multiple applications. If you use like Palm or something, you can go from one to another application, right? Is it really doing context switching, or do you know how, do you, how does it work? It doesn't have enough memory and all those <coughs> things, so it can't really do a context switch, right? So many of them actually would freeze the previous application, and start the new one, right? So if you go from one application to another application, you'll go to a state where everything is 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 stored, and then a new new process is started, right? It looks like you're moving from one to the other, but you're not really because there's only one application running, right? And that's because they, they don't have enough resources to keep both of them running, right? And it's very hard for you to tell that this is happening because when you switch application. Right? It takes a second or so, but these ma machines are not screamers, so you don't expect them to be switching really fast either. So you, you assume that it's switching, it's a switching delay, but actually what's happening is it's freezing your application, it's storing all the state, and completely getting rid of you, and then restoring the new application, right? They can't communicate with each other, right? There's no synchronization primitive, they can't communicate with each other because the other one is not running, right? If you want to synchronize, you have to st freeze yourself, send something to other person and then you stop, right? Um, and, and they have, you know, mostly they have flash or, or micro drive, so you have to worry about uh, those issues, you know, how many times you can write and all those things. And you also want to make sure that you don't keep stuff in, uh, in cache, right? Because these cards can be, you can pull out any time, so if you keep a whole bunch of stuff in cache, then, you're, then whatever you wrote may not be uh, written onto the flash, right? So you have to flash it to the flash. You have to be aware of this stuff, which I don't think many of them are really, they really care. I mean, they don't really care uh, that writing too many times would get rid of your flash, because they assume that in a year or so you should be buying a new device anyway, right? And, and they'll be perfectly happy to sell you a new whatever device, right? But they should. I mean, they should worry about these things. Um, and in terms of security, like some other stuff that you, you may think of, none of these PDAs typically are very secure. Because they assume that it's your device, you know, your, your cell phone need not provide you with a very strong security because it assumes that you will hold on to your um, cell phone a lot more than you hold on to your laptop, I mean, uh, desktop, right? So you get away with some other stuff because of what it does. So that affects how, how things are done. You don't want it to be asking for passwords on your, on your phone too, too often because it's, it's kind of annoying, right? Um, and then you have the notion of laptops, which more and more looks like a desktop. I mean, laptops you can buy, uh, you know, dual core is the standard these days, and next day is like four core or something. You can have enough memory and all those things. Um, I think Dell starts to, is starting to sell the 32 gig uh, flash hard drive now. I think I saw it in Slash a couple of days back. It's like $550 or something for a 32 gig flash disk. Um, That'll make your laptop. So, one of the problems with the laptops and hard disk is remember the hard disks are moving really fast, right? So, if you hard disks don't really like to be, you know, for you to move around like this, right? If you if you shake it, then the mechanisms would, would get into trouble, right? So they go through a lot of effort to make sure that those vibrations are, are avoided, right? Most of the hard disk, if you most of the modern uh, laptop hard disk, if you drop them they shut themselves up before they fall on the ground, right? So they have a little accelerometer which figures out that they are accelerating too fast, and then before it falls, they have to take action. Because otherwise, you know, you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't like, like to have lots of moving parts and stuff, right? So all those electronics can go away when you go to sand, you know, the flash disk and stuff, and that's one of the ways that they are moving towards. And most of these applications are powerful enough that um, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine them to be resource constrained. But the one thing you need to worry about is 
they would like to be uh, sleeping and waking up a lot. I mean, most of you would probably close the laptop and you expect it to go to sleep and wake up, right? Um, so, so can you think of one reason why that may be uh, problematic? How many of you use your laptop to go to sleep and wake up? <coughs> Few of you, right? So when you wake up, what should it do? So when you go to sleep, it should somehow store its state somewhere, right? <coughs> when, it, when you wake up, can it just restore the state and move on? Or does it have to worry about the hardware? It depends on the hardware, right? Some hardware need, may need to be reset every time you, you get back, right? And, and refreshed again. Um, and you're also allowed to change the, you know, put new hardware in, in the device, right? You're allowed to put a new Ethernet card or something. So when it comes back up, it's not just restoring, but also trying to figure out if, if a hardware has changed and sort of do a micro boot kind of thing, right? And that's one of the things which trips most of them up. So if you change the setting, so when it went to sleep, the machine was one way. When it woke up, the machine is completely different, right? And the kernel had to be rebooted and all those things, right? I'll, I'll stop at this point and then we'll continue with, um, with this on Monday. I'll get back to you about the, the assignment.